Well, of course, still in Genesis here. Um, we left off in Genesis 38 and verse 11. Last week, we got through uh, chapter 37. We saw some stuff about Joseph. He had a pretty rough life starting out. Um, when we see him, at least, uh, his brothers hated him. They envied him for being the father's favorite. So they ended up getting back at him by selling him into slavery in Genesis 37. And we got into the first 10 verses of Genesis 38, and we saw some stuff about one of Jacob's sons, Judah. We saw how he was trying to have a family, but his two oldest sons died by the hand of God because um, they were so wicked. And so now his original daughter-in-law that was first married to his oldest son is now husbandless. She had uh, married his second son also, but he was so wicked that God um, killed him also. And so now there's only his youngest son and his technical daughter-in-law. That's not officially his daughter-in-law still at this moment. But as he was still trying to have a family, trying to have descendants to uh, just have an inheritance with, pass on his belongings to after he passes on, he tells Tamar, his daughter-in-law, in verse 11, where we left off, he tells her to remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, that's his youngest son, until he be grown. For he said, lest pre-adventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So, in a sense, Judah was, in a way, blaming Tamar for his son's death. He's saying, just stay at your father's house for now, so he wouldn't have to be taking care of her, and you can marry my youngest son when he gets older, lest he dies with your presence being here. So in a sense, he was blaming her for his previous son's death. So he said, just marry my youngest son when he becomes older. And so he says to do this. And so he said that in verse 11. And then in verse 12, there's a bit of a lengthy reading regarding verse 12 and onward because it's all one whole story in verse 12 through 23. Um, but it all flows together quite well when you just read it verse by verse. And so... It's a bit, a bit of a reading here, but we're going to read it through because it's not hard to understand. We don't, we don't have to really pause and talk about each thing that happens. So verse 12 through 23, I'm just going to read those verses in its entirety. Verse 12, and in process of time, the daughter of Shula, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep bearers and to Timath, Timath, or Timnath, rather, he and his friend Hira, the Adamalite. And so... Judah's wife died, and then we saw Hira earlier in this uh, chapter, just a regular friend of Judah's. In verse 13, it was told to Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath. For she saw that she Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. So it had been a, probably a couple of years now. Shelah was at a point to be able to marry someone. He was old enough for that. But Judah still hadn't given him to marry Tamar. So she's now taking matters into her own hands, taking off garments that signify she is a widow and puts on a veil so no one can see who she really is. Verse 16, when Judah saw her, because she placed herself on the way to Timnath, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face, someone who, who sells their body. He says in verse 16, or the passage says, He turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee. For she knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. Of course, this would be sinful even if she wasn't his daughter-in-law, but now it's, you could say it's extra sinful now. And she said, What wilt thou give what wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come into me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? Will you give me something as a sort of insurance until you send that? He says in verse 18, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thy hand. He gave it to her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So they had relations, a very, a very sinful thing, because they weren't even in a marriage relationship, and she conceived by him. 
Verse 19, she arose and went away and laid her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. So Judah apparently just got scammed. Verse 21, then he asked the men of that place, saying, where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? They said there was no harlot in this place. So she was only pretending to be a harlot for a time, but then right after she, as I said, took off her veil, she went back to living her regular life because she got what she wanted. And the people that were regularly at Timnath knew apparently all the places where people usually were. And they said there was no one even there. So verse 22, he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. So just let her keep my belongings, lest people start to learn that I did this with a harlot. That would be a very shameful thing. People knew what he did. And so it's unfortunate that Tamar did what she did, and um, it's unfortunate that Judah did what he did also. It seems that this side of the family, of Jacob's sons at least, was not too spiritually minded at this time. Judah, his sons, and even his daughter-in-law. And since Judah is deceived by Tamar, who he didn't know it was her, he decides to stop looking for her and just um, stop making a ruckus about it, lest people start to learn that he even had relations with her in the first place, and then shame be brought on him. So verse 24, it came to pass about three months later, that it was told to Judah, saying that Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. It was her. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. That's a pretty intense reaction by Judah hearing this. We don't know who it was that told him this, but whenever it was, or whoever it was, they did indeed tell him. And the only know that she must have been playing the role of a harlot. They only know that somewhere because in Judah's eyes, she was still set to be Shayla's wife, even though um, Judah hadn't kept his promise to that. But therefore, because he realized what she had done, he decides to take action against her to let her be burnt, a punishment toward her. So verse 25, when she was brought forth to him, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, Am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? So the only thing Judah knew was that she was playing the role of a harlot. But now what she's presenting with him is his own signet and bracelets and staff. So now not only does he know that she was playing the role of a harlot, but it was the very harlot that he had relations with. And so it says in verse 26 that he acknowledged that. He saw that they were his. And he said in verse 26, she hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah my son, and to knew her again no more. And so though Tamar was not technically in the whole right in this um, situation here, she was just trying to still ensure that she had a future by having relations with Judah, because Judah wasn't keeping up his end of the deal to give Shelah as a husband to her. And so though she wasn't in the right, Judah still said she was more righteous than I. And so he realized that he was in the wrong for not giving Shayla. And so he didn't uh, pursue this matter any further. And so after this happened, in verse 27, it says, It came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. So the the other brother that was still in there came out fully before the one who only put out his hand. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez. And this name fittingly means breach or to break through. That's the exact thing this uh, child had done in the womb. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zara, which means brightness. So the one who put out his hand first was technically the firstborn, but since the other one was fully out first, it was the other way around. 
And so from Judah's, uh, from Judah's and then his son, Perez's line of descendants was how Jesus was born. And so understanding um, Judah's part of this and going down to uh, his daughter-in-law, going down to Perez, and that whole line of generations is how Jesus was born. And so that is how this chapter could be important to know that because we get more information about the past lineage of Jesus. And so that's all of 38 here, a little bit of information about all of that, about Judah. So before we go on to 39, anyone have any comments so far? Anyone else so far? Looking at chapter 39 now, the story focuses back on Joseph once again. We saw what happened to him in 37. He was sold into slavery. So now we get an update about what happens to him here. The story goes back onto him. We see very quickly how his life turns out after being sold to Potiphar who was the captain of Pharaoh's guards of people. It says in verse 1 that Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had, him bound, which had brought him down thither. So Joseph is under Potiphar's rule. But being blessed by the Lord here, Moses writes that the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, so since the Lord was with Joseph, even though Joseph was in a servant-like position, he was in a very high place spiritually still, being blessed by the Lord, making Joseph a prosperous individual. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that he made, that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Potiphar recognized this, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And it says that Potiphar even made him overseer over his house and put all that he had into his hand. It came to pass that from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So we've definitely seen this idea applied before in previous books of the Bible and even previous chapters of this book alone. A specific example of this is when Jacob was working for Laban, and even without the Bible specifically telling us that Laban was made prosperous, Laban is the one who pointed this out himself. He didn't want Jacob to leave because all of his cattle and flocks were now being in a more abundant sort of way, which was good for Laban. So he didn't want Jacob to leave because Jacob was a man of God. So now this was the same for Joseph. He was a follower of God, a man of God. So he was being blessed making things around him being blessed as well. There is a passage, I believe in Hosea 14, towards the end of the chapter, talking about how when Israel is blessed, those in the shadow of Israel are blessed also. That means cities and nations around them. So that is the case for followers of God. When you are a follower of him, God can bless you, but also those around you. And so Potiphar recognizes this. So when he puts them in this high position to be overseer, all of Pharaoh's things are now growing in abundance as well. But for Joseph's case specifically, he was so blessed by Potiphar, and Potiphar trusted him so much here, that in verse 6, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He knew not even what he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. 
So we trust him so much. He didn't even know all the things he had because he was so rich. He just left them all under Joseph's hand. He didn't know what all there was, but he trusted Joseph enough to keep track of all of it. He, he only knew the bread he had because, of course, he knows what he's eating. That's the only thing he needed to worry about because he trusted Joseph so much. So things are going pretty good for Joseph so far. But unfortunately, um, when life gets pretty good, it can often then get pretty bad quite quickly. Verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She looked his way, and she said, lie with me. This is certainly not for any righteous reasons. She wanted to do sinful things with him, quite the opposite of anything righteous. Joseph's answer, though, was absolutely great. What Joseph says here in the face of temptation and in sin is what we should all be thinking when we are tempted to sin against God. He says in verse 8, or Moses writes in verse 8, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me in the house. He, know, he knows not everything that's in here. He hath committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So talk about a righteous individual, because that certainly is what Joseph is here. He's recognizing he is such a blessed person. He's, he's been blessed in so many ways by Potiphar. Nothing is being kept from him, even though he was sold into slavery. He's in this position of power and being a very trustworthy man, being well favored by everyone, the Bible says. So he recognizes this and says, how then could I sin against God? And we all need to keep that in mind. Whenever we are tempted with sin, we need to remember that God has blessed us with so very much, with Jesus dying for us so that we could have a chance to be saved from our sins. So whenever we're tempted, just remember, you are a blessed person with who you are, so how then can you sin against God? And so he declined this apparent first time, but in verse 10, it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day, so he asked, she asked him over and over that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to even be with her because she was trying to tempt him. It might have been tempting for Joseph, but he continuously declined. He tried his best to distance himself from her. The Hebrew word for day here in verse 10 can mean from sunrise to sunset. Therefore, she could have been asking him multiple times in one day, if that is what this translation is saying here. Not just one time a day, but multiple times through each day that happened. And so he had his eyes focused on the right things in life, on God, not sinful things here. And so he kept on declining her. But then verse 11 she asked again, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, just to do some work as his role in the house was. And there was none of the men in the house there within. There's no one else in the house at this time. In verse 12, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So what a determination Joseph has here to stay faithful. Now she's not just asking over and over to be with him. She physically grabbed him, saying, lie with me, doing her best to get this to happen. But he declined, and he refused so much that he just got out of his jacket as she was holding it and just ran off. He was running from sin. It was a very admirable thing that Joseph was doing here to stay faithful here. Um, but as said, things were going good for him. And now they're slowly but surely declining in his life. Things aren't going so good for him because of the result that happens here. Verse 13. But before we read that, are there any questions so far about this altercation with Joseph that we're reading of? Verse 13. As Joseph went through all of this with Potiphar's wife, it came to pass that when she saw he had left his garment in her hand, and it was fled forth that she called unto the men of the house. So the men must have returned by this point. And she spake to them, saying, See, he, that being Potiphar, hath brought in Hebrew unto us to mock us. And he came in unto, unto me to lie with me. And I cried with a loud voice. 
It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So now after being declined uh, by him for so long, she is now framing him, saying he is the one who tried to lie with her. But when she screamed, maybe saying, get away from me, she's trying to say that he ran because he got scared. Obviously, we know that's not what happened, but in these guards' eyes, these men of the house's eyes, they are just trusting Potiphar's wife. So she is framing him. Verse 16, she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. That's Pharaoh. So she was probably ready to show Potiphar, or rather, Potiphar rather not Pharaoh. Uh, she was trying to show Potiphar what happened in her story as soon as possible. As soon as he got home, she was holding it to try to tell him. Verse 17, it came to pass, uh, she spake unto him according to these words, saying that the Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me, to try to use me, to take advantage of me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. So now probably just about everyone in this house has know, known and heard of Joseph's crime that has happened in Potiphar's eyes at least, um, even though he's just been framed. And so after all the men of the house hear this, and most importantly Potiphar hears this, verse 19, it came to pass when he heard these words, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. So he was very mad. This was rightly so if his wife was telling the truth. And she, we know she was not, but in his eyes, he was certainly in the right for being angry with Joseph. And he would be right if this story was, of course, true. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So making no sort of confusion here, this prison that he was in was in a place for prisoners. That's how he saw Joseph now not in any sort of respected position, but someone who did a crime and is now in prison for that. Are those birds? Are those real birds? That's pretty loud. <laughs> those are real. Um, so Joseph's in prison now at this time. But verse 21, as, just as the Lord was with him before, he is now still with him because it says that exact thing. He was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and gave him grace or gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So how blessed Joseph is, because he is a follower of God, God is still taking care of him. He, was, he found favor in the sight of Potiphar, now he's finding favor even in prison. So that is pretty, a pretty good situation. Joseph is in here, being continuously blessed by God. So we see just how much favor he has in the sight of the keeper of the prison. In verse 22, because after probably a certain amount of time at least, as the keeper of, pri of the prison saw that Joseph was certainly a good individual, it says that he committed to, to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was a doer of it. So even in prison, he was in a position of authority, just as he was in, when he was a slave, in, even though he was in a position of authority then. And so he was in charge of the other prisoners here. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And so he didn't even have to worry about anything, just as Potiphar did not, because Joseph was so trustworthy to be taking care of everything. And so this, I believe, is, can be compared to sort of when prisoners of today's world are continuously acting good, they usually get more privileges than other prisoners, at least I've seen in various shows on television and whatnot. I assume that'd be the case for real if they can be on good behavior, I believe it's called. They get more privileges in prison. And so at this time, it's happening for Joseph. He is being uh, respected more, and specifically because of the Lord blessing him, but the keeper of the prison uh, sees him in a good manner, in a good light as well. So Joseph's life is right at this moment. It's a continuous roller coaster for him going up and down of blessings and unfortunate things, but now it's a good position once again here. So that's all of chapter 39, some more stuff about Joseph. Um, so just moving quickly along here. Any questions so far before we go into 40? Chapter 40 now. 
I believe I read in a commentary that the span of Joseph as he was in prison, though we don't have any official um, uh, passage in the Bible that say it, I don't know, I don't remember the exact proof they had of it, but I believe one commentator said that uh, he was, he could have been in prison for about 12 years um, in total, and so that might be true. I'm not positive on that. I just remember seeing that as I was studying for this. And so, verse 1 of chapter 40. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It says a little bit more about Potiphar um, in this chapter. We don't know everything, though, but we'll get to that in this uh, chapter. But it came to pass, in verse 1, after these things, after he had been put in prison, that over the span of time, apparently, that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. So this was Pharaoh, not Potiphar. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. So the specific prison that Joseph, the keeper, the um, baker, and the butler are now in is all under Potiphar's uh, supervision, his personal prison that he has. And so these are all where these people are. It's under Potiphar's control here. In verse 4, because they were in the Potiphar's uh, prison, Potiphar himself, verse 4, charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in war. And so... It was, the, uh, it was Potiphar's choice specifically to put these prisoners under Joseph's rule, so he must have learned that even in prison, Joseph was still a very respected individual. So I remember reading one commentary saying that this might show that he might have not fully believed his wife because he was still trusting of Joseph in this case to put these prisoners under his authority. So whether that's the case, whether he just had still some sort of respect for Joseph still, he did do this thing for him, having Joseph still be in this sign of authority here. So the butler and baker under, under his rule. And so as this happens, it says in verse 5 that both the baker and the butler, they both dreamed a dream, both of them. Each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in this prison. They had two separate dreams, and they both thought two different things about them, about what these dreams meant. So verse 6, Joseph came unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. He asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? Why, why are you looking so sad? They said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. I think it's definitely interesting here that once they had these dreams, they automatically assumed that they meant something here. This could show that whenever people did have dreams that came from God, whenever God used this practice of sending messages to people, whenever he still did that, because he doesn't, he doesn't do it today, but when he did do that, ha have people have dreams to send messages to them, it was probably quite clear that it would be from God. There must have been a clear, distinct difference between regular dreams that our brain makes up versus dreams that God specifically gave them because they rightly assumed that this was from God. In the Truth for Today commentary, they write that in the ancient Near East, an entire discipline of interpreting dreams existed and manuals were written on the subject. Kings usually had among their advisors a variety of learned specialists, magicians, conjurers, and sorcerers to interpret mysterious dreams. So for these more worldly individuals, they may have thought even their regular dreams were dreams from God, along with dreams that were actually from God, and they thought they needed various people, various types of special people to interpret these dreams. But Joseph's response to them having these dreams is something completely different than people being interpreters of them, um, people that aren't from God at least. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? And so I think what we see here could be compared to 
a situation today in life, in a, maybe sort of a work setting, um, there may be people with different problems in life when they don't know what to do about it. They may think they need to go see some type of specialist to help them. They may, they may say, I need to go to therapy, things like that. And things like this can be useful, therapy and things like that. But Joseph was brave enough to recognize that they also need God in their life to help them with their problems here. And so in today's world, we need to remember to be brave enough and have enough courage to tell people that if they have any problems, God can help you with your problems. The Bible has answers for problems in life. So remember to just look to that also along with various other things to look for for help. But Joseph is simply saying you don't need any sort of fancy magicians or specialists to help you with this. He's saying is God not the interpreter of dreams, he says here. And so he tells them to tell Joseph and he can help you with these dreams. He says, tell me them, I pray you. And so Joseph was apparently saying that since he was a follower of God, that he would be able to tell them what these dreams meant. Um, I'm not sure how he thought he would for sure be able to help them, even though he 100% could. I'm not sure how he knew he had that ability. But nonetheless, he did know, so he's offering his help for them. I can tell you what these dreams mean. And so the butler, he speaks up first here, verse 9. He says, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. What could this dream mean? Well, Joseph responds within verse 12, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. That's some pretty good news for the butler at least. In three days he'll be restored to his uh, position of authority he was in before. He'll no longer um, be in prison. But Joseph adds on to this interpretation of the dream by saying, in verse 14, but think on me when it shall be well with thee, when you are in a good position once again, in other words, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the prison. And so he's saying, since you're going to be out in three days, remember me, because Joseph hasn't done anything wrong to them. He's helping them. He's been kind to them most likely throughout their time in prison. So he's saying, just make mention of me to Pharaoh when you get out of prison and you see him, because I have been wrongly put here. And so, now that the butler has his dream interpreted, verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, when, when he realized, okay, Joseph must know what he's talking about, he said unto Joseph also, verse 16, I also was in my dream. Behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Now, what could this dream mean? Verse 18, Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days, just like the branches were three days for the butler. And then the, uh, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off of thee and shall bring and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. So definitely not as good news for the baker as it was for the butler. Joseph doesn't say anything else after that. He probably recognizes this is bad news. He doesn't need to press the matter any further. He doesn't say to the baker, remember me also, because the baker wouldn't have been able to do that anyway. He was going to be killed when he got out, apparently. And so as Joseph tells them these, imp these interpretations, there are two big things that popped out for me when I was studying these dreams. The first is that there's no doubt that these dreams were from God because of how similar they were, um, being that God used the, the three uh, things upon the baker's head. There were three branches. They were, there were similar things in these dreams, and so God was using the same type of um, illustrations to get across his point of these 
messages in the dream that he was trying to say. And so this can be recognized in today's time. God often uses the same sort of practices um, as he always does. He, he's not, he, he doesn't try to change things, make anything hard to understand. So these dreams were similar. They were definitely from God. Second thing I noticed from this is Joseph's courage here and how when he knew there was a message from God that needed to be said, he wasn't afraid to tell the good news to the butler. He wasn't afraid to tell bad news to the baker. So I think that can be applied to us today also. We certainly have a message from God that is the Bible, that Jesus is here. We don't need to be afraid to tell good news to people. because That's what the gospel is. We also don't need to be afraid to tell them bad news if needed. As 2 Timothy 2, 4, is that it? Yeah, preach the word. It's in season and out of season. Rebuke if necessary. That is not always a pleasant thing to do, but it can be necessary sometimes to rebuke people. And so be ready to tell good news and bad news, just as Joseph was. And so as the butler and baker now have their interpretations, it came to pass that on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that's a coincidence, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, just like Joseph said he would. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So Joseph was quite reliable in what he told this butler and baker, both of what he said, both of the things he said for their dreams came to pass, even though one was good and one was bad. Joseph was still a very reliable individual. And so Joseph specifically asked the butler to remember him, but, verse 23, he didn't remember that. The, the butler did not. It says he did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so pretty unfortunate for Joseph. He specifically requested this. He was so kind to the butler, but the butler couldn't even remember this one thing for Joseph. So, like I said before, it's just an endless up and down roller coaster for good things and bad things and good things and bad things happening for Joseph here. This has certainly been a bad thing by the end of this chapter because the butler didn't remember to make mention of him to um, Pharaoh. So he forgot about him, as it says there. So things might seem hopeless for Joseph for now, at least. But as we'll see soon, it's not hopeless just yet. Um, are there any questions about this chapter 40 thus far? We don't, have, we don't have Mr. Terry here asking questions as usual. That's okay. So chapter 41 then. Um, we see here in this chapter, verse 1, it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. So this was another specific and special dream that was from God. And it says in verse 1 that, Behold, he stood by the river. Behold, there came up out of the river seven well, well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. So there were diff different animals that were there feeding in the meadow he had in his dream. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and the lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. And so Pharaoh awoke. So this was his first dream that he had. But then, verse 5, he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So these two dreams are very similar in what the message is trying to get across thus far. Very similar things with seven good things, seven bad things, and seven bad things devour the seven good things. So Joseph awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So verse 8, it came to pass that in the morning after he had these dreams that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the, magician, all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So, like I said in that commentary, oftentimes the 
people who had dreams from God, called various magicians, various specialists to try to interpret them. But for this case, no one could even do so. They couldn't remember, or they couldn't um, interpret these dreams. But there is good news here. Verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in ward in the Pharaoh of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream, and one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. But there was a young man there with us, in Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. So now, he is remembering Joseph. For whatever reason, he forgot. He forgot before, but now, having a similar situation of dreams from God, he is remembering it. He remembered that he went to prison. There was a man there that could interpret dreams rightly because he knew that these dreams came to pass. I have in my notes that it was two years in between chapters 40 and 41, and so it's two years that he, after he had left prison that he finally remembers Joseph. And so the butler tells uh, Pharaoh what Joseph did, so he must be able to probably still do it now, interpret these dreams. And so, verse 13, it came to pass as he interpreted it to us, so it was me, he restored unto his office, and him he hanged. The dreams came to pass. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Joseph. So he is presenting himself in a good manner because he's coming up to someone into a position of authority. And so that's something we can learn today. Um, coming into a place of someone who has power, it's good to look your best always. And so Joseph, he shaved himself. He put new garments on to look presentable for Pharaoh. And it says in verse 15 that Pharaoh, he told his dream unto Joseph. He says, I have dreamed a dream. There is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou can interpret, or thou, thou can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me, but God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So just as before, he, before he officially interpreted the dreams for the butler and the baker, he specifically said, Do not interpretations come from God. It's not he's recognizing that fact here. It's not of my ability. It's God that's going to give you your answer here. And so he tells Pharaoh that. He establishes that this is how it will be. Verse 17, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and he, he just goes through the dream of which we just read of what happened with the river and in the corn. And so that's in verses 17 through 24, uh, just the same thing of what his dreams were before, so we don't have to go over that again. But he tells him his dream, and he says that none of the magicians could declare unto me, verse 24. And so Joseph responds within 25 that the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. And so to know what God was about to do, Joseph was about to tell him here. He says that the seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. So even though we had two different dreams, the meaning of them were the same meaning. And so he says in verse 27 that the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is a thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. So God is giving warning to Pharaoh of what is going to happen. There will be seven good years and the seven bad years. So verse 29, he finishes explaining the dream. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And so this is bad news for Pharaoh because the very land of which he is over is going to go, even though it's going to go through some good times, it's going to go through bad times as well. And so it's unfortunate for Pharaoh, but that's just what's going to happen for him at this time at least. So it's bad news for him. But um, it's time to end here. And so 
This is about to end here in verse, uh, verse 39 here, or verse 31 rather. So we'll pick up here next week. Thank you for your attention.